Because of the following special program, Sunday with Jack Benny, Ted Mack and the original Amateur Hour, the 20th Century, and Mr. Ed will not be seen today, but will return next week at their regular times on most of these stations. You are watching an official reenactment of the murder of President John F. Kennedy. Film from the window where the alleged assassin crouched. And through the telescopic sight of his rifle. This is a CBS News Extra. November 22nd and The Warren Report. Here is CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite. November 22nd, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was shot to death in full view of hundreds of spectators watching him in a Dallas, Texas motorcade. 48 hours later, the man Dallas police said shot the president, Lee Harvey Oswald, was himself killed by Jack Ruby in full view of millions of Americans watching television. This bizarre sequence of double killings raised great questions. Who actually fired the shots that killed Kennedy? Why did Ruby shoot Oswald? Was there a conspiracy? Were right-wingers involved? Was it a Russian plot, a Cuban plot? The new president, Lyndon Johnson, ordered these questions answered. He appointed a commission of seven prominent Americans to investigate the whole affair. He literally drafted Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren as chairman. This committee labored 10 months, took testimony from hundreds of witnesses, then brought forth a document close to a thousand pages. The report is signed by Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States, Richard B. Russell, Senator from Georgia, John Sherman Cooper, Senator from Kentucky, Hale Boggs, Representative from Louisiana, Gerald R. Ford, Representative from Michigan, Alan W. Dulles, ex-head of the CIA, John J. McCloy, diplomat and presidential advisor. President Johnson received that report on Thursday. He specified that it be made public today. At 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving 30, CBS News will reveal the substance of that report. During this two-hour broadcast, there will be no commercial announcement. Months ago, long before the commission finished its work, CBS News set out to interview the key witnesses who appeared before the commission. Those officially involved in the Warren Commission's investigations, the FBI men, the Secret Service agents, in all propriety, declined to talk before our cameras. But the dozens of ordinary men and women whose lives had become deeply involved with the story of the president's death told us basically the same stories that they told the Warren Commission. Among these witnesses, the wife, the mother, the best friend, the boarding house keeper, the police chief, the boss, the fellow workers, the girls who took a picture, the governor, the rifle range manager, the bus driver, the cab driver, the woman who saw a policeman Tippett shot, the clerk who spotted a suspect, the officer who captured Lee Harvey Oswald. The assassination of President Kennedy was, inevitably, a mystery story on a grand scale. On the scene, covering the events of those dark days, was CBS News correspondent Dan Rapp. During the last five months, CBS News has been filming interviews with people involved in the Kennedy and Oswald murder stories. All of these people were principal witnesses for the Warren Commission. The CBS News interviews were conducted by Eddie Barker, news director for CBS affiliate KRLD-TV in Dallas. He, too, was an on-the-scene reporter for radio and television during those days. The story is essentially that of two men whose paths came a fatal 270 feet apart on a Friday afternoon last November. One man was President Kennedy, halfway through a triumphant tour of Texas. He had decided on the trip against the advice of some Texas friends who thought he might not get a warm welcome. But the Texas trip had gone well. There had been wildly enthusiastic crowds in San Antonio, Houston, and Fort Worth, and even in Dallas, where political feeling ran strongly against Mr. Kennedy, the magic of his name and the prestige of his office brought out a huge, warm crowd. Among that crowd was a man named Oswald, 
a man who all his life had stood a little apart from society. He had served in the Marines, then suddenly gone to Russia, defected, then changed his mind. With financial assistance from the American Embassy, he returned 32 months later with a Russian wife, Marina. He had trouble getting a job and got involved in a pro-Castro movement in New Orleans. Last November, Oswald was working in Dallas in a building beneath which the presidential motorcade was to pass. What was Oswald's background? Few people really knew. Among those called for Warren Commission testimony on the subject were Oswald's wife, his mother, and Mrs. Ruth Payne, in whose home Marina Oswald and her children stayed. First with Eddie Barker, the mother, Marguerite Oswald. He was a happy-go-lucky youngster, actually. He had a dog, he had a bicycle, he belonged to the Y. He used to go to the Y and go swimming. I know many a time while I'd work, he'd come in to see me from the Y, ringing wet and being the winter time. And I'd tell him he was going to catch cold because his hair was still wet like all boys. He wouldn't dry himself thoroughly. He loved to play Monopoly. He knew any and everything there was to know about animals. He studied animals, was often in the zoo. And as we know, he was picked up in the Bronx Zoo while in New York uh, uh, playing hooky from school. And I consider that normal also, playing hooky from school. Many, many boys do this. We know, and it's sad and unfortunate, that Lee was deprived of his father. And he was born two months after his father had expired. But we must understand that Lee had two brothers. So he was not raised just with a woman alone. Mrs. Oswald, uh, how old was Lee when he went in the Marine Corps? And Lee was exactly 17 years old when he went in the Marine Corps. He enlisted on his birthday. Mrs. Oswald, why do you think your son went to Russia? I think my son was sent to Russia. Uh, you see, Lee uh, knew Russian fluently, read and write. Uh, he filed an application for Albert Schweitzer School, and on the application, I have an original application, it stated that I speak and write Russian. Where did he learn this? This is what I was going to tell you. He learned this while in the Marines, because Lee was in the Marines, and only out three days when he went to Russia. So Lee had to learn this while in the Marines. What did you think about uh, your son marrying a Russian girl? Well, to me, uh, a Russian girl, uh, any foreign girl, a Negro, or just any human being, live and breathe just like I do. And so it made no difference to me that he married a Russian girl. I believe that Lee was told to marry the Russian girl. He probably loved her and was going with her because he knew her six weeks when he married her. But I think that he had orders from the State Department to marry the Russian girl. Mrs. Oswald, do you feel that your son was an agent of the CIA? Yes, it's not that I feel that he was an agent of the CIA. It's because I have so much correspondence with the State Department, plus the letters that Lee wrote to me from Russia, that indicates that he was an, uh, an agent of our government, definitely. Did he ever intimate to you in any way that he was an agent of the government? No, and there again, this is Lee's disposition. He wouldn't tell a mother that he was working for the government. Possibly he might think that I might give the secret away. I'm under the impression that when you are a CIA or any uh, undercover agent, then naturally you're a little secret about it, and the boy wouldn't tell me that. Mrs. Oswald's opinions about her son and his career are the same she says she expressed to the Warren Commission. The two most important questions she raises are, what was Oswald doing in Russia? And was he, at any time, an agent of the United States or the Soviet government? There are other interesting and vital questions involved in this matter of Oswald's relations with our government. In order to leave Russia, he borrowed $435 from the State Department. In order to get a new passport, he needed to repay it. He repaid it in full, while working sporadically at $1.50 an hour, barely enough to support his family. And in June of last year, Oswald applied for a passport to various countries of Europe, including Russia. He received that passport in just one day. With his record, how did he get one so fast? We'll have the Warren Commission's answers when the report is made public in an hour and a quarter. Now for more testimony from witnesses who appeared before the Commission and were interviewed later by CBS News. Here again is Dan Rather. 
Lee Harvey Oswald lived last November in a Dallas boarding house under an assumed name. His family lived in a Dallas suburb in the home of their best friend, Mrs. Ruth Payne. What did she think of the Oswald? In the spring, I felt that, uh, that he didn't care, that uh, I, all I knew really about him was that he wanted her to be sent back to uh, the Soviet Union, and she didn't want to go. And it was knowing this, really, that led to my first inviting her to stay with me, feeling that uh, it was somehow inhospitable not to offer her an alternative when she didn't want to go back. And I thought uh, very ill of him that he was wanting to send her back. As you uh, look back on your uh, knowing Lee Harvey Oswald, did he uh, ever appear to be uh, irrational in any way? Uh, how would you describe him in that sense? I would say he never appeared to be irrational, no. I, uh, I thought of him as a, an unhappy person, a person dissatisfied with the life he was leading and with the society he was in. I think he had been just as dissatisfied in Russia as he was here. As uh, I understand it, the rifle that uh, he used in the assassination of the president was stored in your garage. Is this uh, correct? Well, from what's happened since, I judge so. Uh, I didn't know that he had a gun. I would have not wanted him to keep it here if I had known. The rifle, which Oswald carries so proudly in this photograph, was Italian war surplus, bought by Oswald under an assumed name from a mail order house. The rifle and the scope sight cost him 1995. His wife had good reason to remember it. He uh, came in the house 11.30. He was so pale, nervous, and do not talk. I said, what happened to him? And he said, he told, I tried to shut General Walker. And I asked him, who, who, who is General Walker? <coughs> and he told me he was fascist. And I asked him if he had wife and children. He said, no, he's single. I said, but this does not make a difference. This is not a way to show who wrong, who right. Who wrong? Right. And he told me, hmm, if uh, Hitler was shot before war, this was better for most people. Did you ever see the rifle? Yes. But I, uh, you know, I fear, to fear to take this rifle. I just saw, you know, in the corner. I never don't touch this rifle. Did you see the pistol? Yes. Where did he keep the pistol? In his room. <laughs> and he don't like if I clean his room. And <coughs> he don't want if I see every time what he has <coughs> in his room. And he keep closed. In the spring of 1963, Oswald signed his membership card in the Fair Play for Cuba Committee with an alias. This was in New Orleans, where he had found a job and to where he had moved Marina. He spent hours passing out pamphlets on New Orleans streets for the Fair Play Committee. But he lost his job, and in September, only two months before the assassination, Mrs. Payne drove the family back to Dallas. I thought of him as a, a dissenter, a pamphlet passer, a person not contented with society as it was, nor with himself, nor his... Uh, or the credit he was getting for being the sort of person he was. I think he felt he wasn't noticed or uh, given sufficient uh, credit. His uh, wife complained of him as uh, having an overblown opinion of himself, and I think he did. He was not a particularly capable person, and he certainly had very little training so that he was not able to get jobs that interested him. He was lucky indeed to get any job. He uh, argued some with his wife. I never saw him violent with her. Uh, he was uh, here a guest and recognized that fact, uh, polite to me at all times. And I could see that he cared about Marina a great deal. 
I really felt that she was his only uh, human contact of real value to him. He was by himself a great deal. He didn't try to make friends. But he valued his closeness with Marina and uh, knew that she was a good wife for him. During the last weeks of his life, Oswald lived in this rooming house, a few miles from downtown Dallas. The housekeeper, Mrs. Roberts, recalled her lodger well. Tell me about the first time you ever saw O.H. Lee. Well, he came in in the afternoon around four, uh, between three and four o'clock. I wanted to rent a room. I had one little small room, this little eight dollar room. And he'd taken it and registered his O.H. Lee. What did he say when he came in? When I uh, see the room that I had for rent, and I showed him the only one I, that was for rent, mm -hmm. and he taken it. See, he wanted to be closer to his work. But he didn't have the job then at that Texas bookstore. He got it that day and went to work the next morning. Did he pay his rent on time? Oh, yes, all except but one week in, and that was when uh, on our mistress day. And he come back in and says, well, I had a long weekend, which is on Tuesday, and paid his rent. He always paid on Monday afternoon when he come in. What did uh, you talk to him about when he paid the rent? Well, I'd just uh, take it and I'd say thank you, and he'd turn and walk off and never say nothing. Now, you didn't get a good grunt out of him. Those stories raise uh, some more questions with which the Warren Commission report will deal. Did he own the rifle and pistol used in the double murder? Did he actually try to kill retired General Edwin Walker? Oswald got a job in the Texas School Book Depository on the corner of Elm and Houston Streets. There have been published reports supposing that he may have been planted in that building by conspirators who wanted him there where he could fire at the president or to get others in positions to do so. But these witnesses before the Warren Commission told another version of how and why Oswald was employed. Mrs. Payne, who knew Oswald needed a job. Mrs. Linnie Mae Randall, who knew where he might get one from Roy S. Truly at the Texas School Book Depository. Mrs. Payne, did you uh, help him obtain the job that he uh, had at the Texas School Book Depository? Well, it came about through a coincidence. I was having coffee with a neighbor. Marina was there also. Uh, Lee had spent a week unsuccessfully looking for a job in Dallas. And this was a Monday. And my neighbor and I and Marina were all talking about uh, this difficulty, how hard it was for him since he, for one thing, was not able to drive, couldn't get to a good many jobs that might be available. Uh, and a third neighbor who was there suggested that there might be an opening at the school book depository. I did not know there was a job open there, but since my brother had got work there, I thought there might be another opening there. When Lee called at the house that evening, Monday evening, I told him about this possibility, and uh, he applied the next day and was accepted. So he came down and filled out an application. I interviewed him. He seemed to be uh, well-mannered, quiet, and intelligent young fella. He stated to me and also put on his application that he had been serving in the Marines and had an honorable discharge. He was in good physical shape, had been in no trouble, and uh, needed the job, needed to go to work to support his family. So I told him that uh, after talking with him that we had some temporary work that I would try him on it if he cared to go to work in the warehouse. The question basic in those interviews is, how did Oswald come to be in a position where he could shoot the president? And of course, that question is bound up with the much larger one concerning a possible conspiracy by others to have Oswald, or to help him, perform the deed. The Warren Report will answer. Lee Harvey Oswald was known to the FBI in Dallas, an FBI agent James Hostie had visited Marina just a few weeks before the assassination. According to one explanation published after the shooting, that check by the FBI was considered a routine one, not connected with the approaching trip of the president, but was information about Oswald passed on by the FBI to the Secret Service. 
Only the Warren Commission report can answer that. Was FBI information on Oswald given to Dallas police? Eddie Barker asked Police Chief Jesse Curry. Had the Dallas Police Department uh, ever heard of Lee Harvey Oswald prior to November? No, sir. So we didn't. We did not have any uh, information on this man in our criminal intelligence file, and that's normally where it would have been in our subversive file, as we refer to it. And Captain Pat Gunaway, Dallas Police Intelligence Officer. First time I heard the name Lee Harvey Oswald was on the afternoon of the 22nd of November, 1963. A most obvious question, why weren't the Dallas police warned about Oswald? And did the FBI and Secret Service exchange information about Oswald? The Warren Report must answer these questions and go on to the larger subject of the whole process of, pro of protecting the president during his Texas trip and other trips, including the rules and the roles of local police, the Secret Service, which has always had the primary duty of guarding presidents, and the FBI. Their roles and missions in relation to what happened in Dallas are expected to result in recommendations for changes in the way presidents are protected. Since he lived in Dallas, not far from his job at the book depository, and his family lived 15 miles away with Mrs. Payne out in the suburb of Irving, Oswald used to ride out to the Payne home on Friday nights with a fellow worker, Wesley Frazier. He usually stayed in Irving during the weekend and returned to the book depository with Frazier on Monday mornings. But one week in November, his routine changed. Well, he come to me the Thursday, November the 21st, and asked me could he uh, ride home with me that afternoon. And I said, well, yes. And I said, well, why are you going home this afternoon? And he replied that he wanted to go home and pick up some curtain rods where he could put some curtains up in his apartment. And I said, oh, very well. And then I said, uh, well, will you be going home with me tomorrow also? And he said, no. He said he wouldn't be going home with me on the 22nd. So he told you that he wanted to come out there and pick up some curtain rods, and this was on Thursday morning? Yes. And at that time, he told you that he would not ride home with you Friday night? Right. Why did Oswald want to go to Irving Thursday? What was in the parcel he carried? On the evening of November 21st, President Kennedy arrived at the Texas Hotel in Fort Worth, where he was to spend the night before continuing on to Dallas and Austin the next morning. And Lee Oswald was, was with his wife and children in Irving. The next day was November 22nd. Few Americans would ever forget where they were and what they were doing that day. When the Warren Commission started trying to reconstruct the who, what, when, and where of that Black Friday in Dallas, these were the key witnesses. Police Chief Curry in the lead car of the presidential motorcade. Texas Governor Connolly, who was with the president in the car behind. Three of the men at the book depository, James Jarman, Harold Norman, and Bonnie Ray Williams. All three of them would be watching from the fifth floor as this dramatic picture, taken a few moments after the assassination later showed. Howard L. Brennan, who was standing across from the book depository, he saw the fatal shot fired from a sixth floor window. Mary Mormon and Jean Hill, the two young Dallas women who'd wanted a snapshot of the president and got one exactly when the shooting started. Police officer James Foster, who was on guard at the railroad overpass, and the voices of Dallas policemen. For every time a radio message went between the squad cars and the headquarters, it was tape recorded. Lee Harvey Oswald was driven from suburban Irving to downtown Dallas the morning of November 22nd by his co-worker Wesley Frazier. They talked about the rain and they talked about babies. Oswald had a package of what he said were curtain rods. As Oswald and Frazier drove and talked, President Kennedy was talking at a breakfast in Fort Worth. I said that I uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. <laughs> Nobody wonders what Lyndon and I wear. <laughs> President, we know that you don't wear a hat. <laughs> we couldn't let you leave Fort Worth without providing you with some protection against the rain.
put it on in the uh, White House on Monday. If you'll come up there, you'll have a chance to see it there. <laughs> Outside, the sun was about to break through the drizzle. From Fort Worth, the Kennedys flew to Dallas. With them was Governor Connolly. The story he told the Warren Commission, he repeated to Eddie Barker. How about the plane trip over from Fort Worth to Dallas? Were you uh, with the president during Yes, the uh, uh, I was with the president from the time he arrived in San Antonio on the 21st, uh, traveling the car with him at all times, and uh, Ms. Connolly and I did. And we flew over from uh, Fort Worth with him. And uh, he, he was jubilant about uh, the reception he'd had. You see, at Fort Worth, this was the third stop we'd made. And uh, we were all eagerly awaiting uh, uh, the arrival in Dallas. Of course, we didn't talk about it much, as you well know, because it's not a very long flight in the 707 from, uh, from, Dallas, uh, from Fort Worth to Dallas. Almost half of the presidents in this century have been targets for would-be assassins. But to President Kennedy, this was a risk that had to be taken, and arriving in Dallas, he took it. He loved to mingle in crowds. It seemed to give him new spirit and sustenance. And he thought a president should see and be seen by the people. He did not want risk to force him into a closed, protected automobile, and since the rain had stopped, there was no other reason for using one. So in an open convertible, the Kennedys sat on the back seat, the Connollys on the middle or jump seat, and the motorcade started. We received as, uh, as warm, as enthusiastic, as spontaneous, uh, a reception as we did in any city in the state. Uh, and it was really wonderful to the point where just as we turned uh, down by the courthouse, uh, Nellie turned around and, and said to the president, uh, she, she was so impressed by the warmth of the reception, she turned around and said to the president, but you can't say that, uh, that Dallas doesn't love you too. And uh, he said, no, I think that's apparent. And uh, all words to that effect. Well, it was me that had made the remark, boy, the, the, this remark, well, in five minutes we'll have it over with, meaning that we were five minutes away from the trademark. I noticed this one man on the sixth floor of the Texas bookstore and by himself. Well, he uh, left the window a couple of times in the course of uh, seven, eight, or ten minutes. The time was almost 12.30. The motorcade would turn and turn again at the book depository. There, three of the employees were watching from windows on the fifth floor. Oswald, according to Dallas police, was one floor above, hidden behind a stack of cartons. Right across the street was a low concrete wall, and there Mr. Brennan was sitting. He would see the president clearly, and also see the book depository. Having made the turn, the motorcade would go on down Elm Street. Here, two young women waited with a Polaroid camera and they would have their pictures just seconds after the president passed. From there, the motorcade went beneath a railway overpass. On that overpass was Dallas policeman James Foster. He had already checked the identity of the men working on the overpass. The motorcade made the first turn. I see it is that the president was getting close, and it wouldn't be too long before I'd get to see the president. And when he turned uh, down Houston Street, well, I saw him, and he seemed to be very happy, cheerful, and he was enjoying the applause and the cheer that the people were giving him. Then uh, the motorcade got to Elm, and it turned and started towards the uh, triple underpass. The president, he was waving at people as he went by, and you know, occasionally he would brush his hair back. The last thing I saw the president do was push his hair back, and um, the only comments that we made about the president was that uh, his tan was beautiful, and also his hair was looking good that day. I made the remark that, my, that's a beautiful car, isn't it? And Hank said, yes, it is. I said, I sure would like to have something like that. And just about that time, we heard the sirens, and everything began to pick up, and everyone was so excited. And as they came down, the, the motorcade came down the slope. Uh, we all got caught up in this, the thrill of going to, we're going to see a president, and I stepped out into the street, so I took the camera and, and uh, aimed it, uh, focused it, and just stood there and looked through it for quite a few seconds, because I wanted to be sure that they were looking at me. And uh, as I followed it for 
oh, so many seconds, and then I did take the picture. Just as the shutter snapped, there was a shot. And this is what Mrs. Mormon found in her Polaroid camera. I heard the shot, and I say shot because I immediately thought it was a shot. I immediately thought it was a rifle shot. I've hunted a great deal in my life. I fired a rifle many times, and, and I thought it was a rifle shot. Uh, why, I don't know, but I immediately thought uh, uh, of an, an assassination attempt. Uh, it's the only thing that crossed my mind. Uh, a fear just uh, swept through me, and I, I me immediately thought of him, of course. I was sitting on the jump seat uh, in the seven passenger car immediately in front of him. And I turned, th thinking that the shot had come from back over my right shoulder. And I turned to look in that direction. I think motivated by two things. First, to see if I could see where the shot came from, see if I could see anything unusual. But equally or more important to me at that moment in my thought processes was a desire to see him, see if anything had happened, see if he was all right. So I turned and I obviously saw nothing but a, a tremendous crowd of people from, wh from where we had just come. And I saw nothing unusual, nothing out of the way, except people also had startled looks on their faces. They were turning, they were looking, uh, and I didn't catch him in the corner of my eye. So I was in the process of turning to my left to look back over my left shoulder uh, to see if I could see him in the back seat. And that's when I felt uh, the impact of the bullet that hit me. Uh, there, was no, there was no great pain uh, uh, associated with the, the bullet that hit me, notwithstanding it went in my back shoulder and came out my chest right here. I felt as if someone had just hit me in the back, a sharp blow with a doubled up fist. It was an impact rather than any, any sort of a, of a searing pain. It, it more or less knocked me over uh, at least enough to where I looked down and of course I was, I was covered with blood and frankly thought that I had uh, uh, been fatally hit. I, I said, uh, as I recall, uh, my God, they're going to kill us all. So there was, no, there was no thought in my mind, really, but what this was, an assassination a tip. Uh, I did not hear the second shot, the one that hit me. Now, I understand there's some, uh, some question in the minds of the experts about uh, whether or not we could both have been hit with the same bullet, and that was the first bullet. Uh, I just don't happen to believe that. I don't believe it, and I will believe it. Uh, because, again, I heard the first shot. I recognized it for what I thought it was. Uh, I had time to turn uh, to try to see what had happened. I was in the process of turning again before I felt the impact of a bullet. Now, obviously, if uh, the bullet that hit me hit me before I could hear it, I was never conscious of the sound of the second bullet at all. I never heard the second bullet. Uh, after I said, uh, my God, they're going to kill us all, uh, uh, I, of course, didn't know that they'd actually hit the president. Uh, because I had not seen him. He had not said a word. We had a second shot, and that's when I recognized saw the people start falling on the ground. So uh, we said, well, someone is shooting at the president. And then, at first we didn't believe it because it, it just seemed so untrue, you know? And then uh, the, uh, the other fellow, uh, Harold Norman, said, yes, I believe he's been shot at. And I think everybody then knew that this was not firecrackers or, or torpedoes up in the railroad yards, but that it was shots. Then I whirled around and fell on the ground, and I told my friend, I said, Gee, those are shots. They're shooting. Get down. And some people were falling to the ground and pushing their children and covering them. But before the third shot was fired, I told the guys that I, you know, believe the shot came from the building above us. And, uh, Eventually, I guess they agreed with me because one of the guys said, I believe you're right. And I said, I know I'm right because I could hear something sound as though the hulls were hitting the floor and I could hear the projection of the rifle. It was like that, you know. Then after uh, that, uh, I noticed Bonnie Ray had uh, some debris in his head. James Jarman said that uh, he, um, I had this uh, cement in my head and that he saw it there, you know. So therefore, that was caused by some kind of uh, loud or sound or something that it took the old building to make this 
fall down to my head. And therefore, we decided it really came from the sixth floor because the only floor above us was the sixth floor. Uh, about this time, I looked back in the rearview mirror, and I could see that there was some commotion in the president's car. And uh, about that time, one of the, I could see that it was speeding up also. And about that time, uh, uh, Nellie pulled me down into, I had turned again in, re in reaction to this, this bullet and had turned facing my right. She pulled me over into her lap and put her head down on top of mine and just kept, uh, kept talking to me and, and saying, you're going to be all right, you're going to be all right. I was conscious uh, the whole time. Uh, I never lost consciousness and I was lying there and heard the third shot. Now, it takes a long time to tell this, Eddie, but uh, this all happened, as you well know, in a matter of seconds. Uh, I heard the third shot very distinctly. Uh, I heard it hit. I assumed that it hit the president, and it obviously did. I looked directly across and up. Possibility at a 45 degree angle. And this man, same man I had saw prior to the president's arrival, was in the window and taking aim for his last shot. After he fired the last or the third shot, or he didn't seem to be in a great rush, hurry. He uh, seemed to pause for a moment to see if for sure he accomplished his purpose, and he brought the gun back to rest in upright position as though uh, he was satisfied. His arm flew up and, the, you know, his hair kind of jumped and... Uh, it appeared that the president's head just exploded. But I did not see it hit him, but I heard it hit. And I, you obviously, again, if you've ever done any firing, uh, even at 200 or 300 yards when you fire a rifle uh, at a deer, uh, you you know from the sound of that shell, the whine of it, whether or not it hit its target or whether it didn't. Makes a different sound. Well, obviously, uh, the bullet, the third shot, hit something. And it was very obvious after that because uh, the evidence was splattered all over the car and uh, all over my clothes and all over Nellie. And, and uh, so there was, was no question about what had happened. I, my eyes were open, I was conscious. I saw the two Secret Service men in the front seat. I heard what they said. Uh, what did they say? Uh, Roy Kellerman, uh, who was in the right front, uh, uh, between the, the second and the third shot, between the time I was hit and between the time of the third shot, uh, both the driver and Roy were looking back into the back seat to see what had happened. This was all again happening in a matter of seconds. And they, they both had a, a look of almost consternation on their face. So Roy, uh, in the right seat, turned around uh, on a radio communications, obviously, working something on, his, on the panel of the car, and said, uh, uh, get out of the line, or something to the driver, words to that effect, get out of the line. And then he said, apparently over the radio, get us to a hospital quick. Saw the people running, and, and some people was hollering and everything, you know, like that. And um, the policemen seemed like they was confused because they were running in the wrong direction. They were running towards the uh, railroad tracks. Officer Foster, was there any doubt in your mind about the direction from which those shots came? Uh, no, sir. Well, uh, not up to. I had moved to the railroad. Uh, there was no doubt that the were coming from back of the motorcade toward um, Houston. The Secret Service man asked me for a description. I gave him a description of a man in his early 30s wearing light khaki colored clothing, height 5 foot 9 or 10, weighing 170 pounds. About this time, one of my motorcycle officers rode up beside of me and and I asked him what had occurred back there, if that was shots, and he said, yes. And I said, was anybody hit? And he said, yes, I'm sure they were. And uh, so I told then, uh, got on the radio and told uh, my dispatcher to notify Parkland Hospital that we were en route 
code three to stand by for an emergency. All traffic off of the emergency entrance to Parkland Hospital and all emergency equipment off of Industrial Boulevard. So we immediately pulled out uh, of the caravan and began picking up speed. The car never stopped, did it? No, the car never stopped. And uh, about this time, uh, I lost consciousness. Uh, I was not conscious on the ride uh, to the hospital, which is only a matter of about six or seven minutes. Can you give us any information as to what happened to these people out here? President involved. I do not know the seriousness of it or the possibility that six or seven more people may have been shot. 10 4 12 40, 15 car 2. Did they arrive? They had the suspect? No, they do not have the suspect. I came to again. Apparently, the, the braking action uh, of the car uh, brought me back to consciousness. And Nellie uh, later told me, of course, that we had a very wild ride. Uh, and apparently, we were traveling at a very, very high rate of speed down the freeway to the hospital. Uh, it, was a, it was a time of, of, of just unbelievable uh, stark tragedy. Uh, you. Uh, <coughs> So many things go through your mind uh, at that moment uh, that I think it's pro probably impossible to relate at any future time all the things that you thought. Uh, I, I know I thought, uh, again, I rather assumed without knowing uh, that the president had been fatally wounded. Uh, and I, I rather assumed uh, that uh, that I had been. Uh, and so constantly there was going through my mind thoughts of, of Nellie, of the children, of, of what she'd done. And it's uh, really difficult, I think, to try to explain uh, uh, all the things that you wonder about, all the things that you concern yourself with at a time like that. I lit some candles, and Marina asked me if that was a way of praying, and I said that it was. Although, even then, I felt that he was uh, mortally wounded. And then we heard that he was dead. And Marina said to me, what a terrible thing this is for uh, Jacqueline Kennedy and for the children. Now they will have to grow up without a father. Because I, I think about Jackie and about her children. Mm. So what and other, and uh, this then time, I don't know if there is still nice. I'll be, you know, looks like a widow with, ki with children. You know, this, when this happened, and I think about how it looks like this happened with me, maybe, you know, my intuition told me that I was just, I feel it looks like this happened with me. You know, mother stared with children, no father. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, you're saying that you know. when you saw this, you thought uh, mm -hmm. you, you put herself Yes, in her position. Yes, yourself in her position. Um, um. Did you uh, ever have a thought at this time that maybe Lee had killed the president? Um, Ruth Payne told me uh, somebody from Lee work, you know, the school, school book depository, you know, shot the you know, uh, president. And, you know, my heart go down because I think, you know, just one thing, maybe this was late. And I go in the garage, I know this rifle was over there, and I saw this blanket, and I thought, oh, that's good, this is not Lee. But Marina Oswald was wrong. The blanket in which Lee kept his rifle was indeed there in the garage, but the rifle was not. It took a bit under six seconds to assassinate the President of the United States. 
It took the Warren Commission 10 months to measure out those seconds bit by bit. Much of their work centered on the question, was it really Oswald who fired the rifle? Even if Oswald owned the rifle, even if he went home to get it Thursday night, did he fire the weapon at the present? There are other questions about the shooting. Exactly how many shots were there? And uh, did they all come from the school book building? The police say the rifle was in a sixth floor window, a window behind the present. Yet some witnesses believe they heard shots from in front of him. There was what appeared to be a bullet uh, nick in the windshield of the limousine. And Parkland Hospital doctors were quoted to say they thought at least one bullet entered Mr. Kennedy's neck from the front. Studiously, scientifically, the Warren Commission tried to answer these questions, tried to sift fact from rumor and theory. This is a film made for the Commission in December, a reconstruction of the crime at the scene of the crime. In this film, and for the film, investigators sat in a car exactly where the president and the governor sat. The car was driven over the exact route at the same speed. And in the window where Lee Oswald is said to have waited, a cameraman waited with Oswald's gun sight. For a moment, a tree is in the way. Now, must be when the first shot was fired. At exactly this point, the investigators halted the car. Chalk was used to mark the spots where the bullet struck. Then the line of fire and every length and angle of every possible shot from the window was measured exactly. FBI, Secret Service, and military experts applied their years of training and experience in measuring those chalk spots. Again and again, the bullet angles were measured. The chalk spots were redone. But Chief Justice Earl Warren went to Dallas himself in June, went to the window, and Warren personally looked through the rifle sight. All this mattered because if there were any shots from the overpass, if there were more than three shots, then Oswald had to have had an accomplice. So some big questions which the Warren Report will answer in the coming hour. Where did the bullets come from? How many were there? These questions of direction and number of bullets which struck President Kennedy and Governor Connolly are matched in importance by the whole matter of speed in firing. Could Oswald fire a bolt-action rifle fast enough to hit moving targets in a few seconds? Could anyone operate such a rifle with such deadly accuracy in so short a time? These matters have been widely discussed the world over for 10 months. The Warren Commission had the benefit of the best ballistics experts in this country. We'll have their conclusions a little later. The experts can check and measure, but Eddie Barker talked to two men who told the Commission they actually saw Oswald with a rifle in his hands. They are Malcolm Price, supervisor of a sports rifle range outside of Dallas, and Garland Slack, who practiced there. Mr. Price is examining another Italian Carcano rifle, the same make and model as Oswald. CBS News had this rifle brought out to the rifle range. Mr. Price, when was the first time you saw Lee Harvey Oswald out here at this rifle range? Uh, it was the first day that we were open here. And, uh, he came in just about closing time, just about dusky dark, and requested that he be allowed to fire his rifle. And uh, also, he was looking for someone to set the telescope for him. Did you set it? Yes, I did. He was quite talkative to me when we were discussing uh, his rifle and uh, his telescope. But as far as being an outright conversationist or talking to any of his neighboring shooters, he didn't. He kept strictly to himself, except for one time. And uh, he was shooting next to a fellow by the name of Garland Slack. Well, we were shooting the targets, and uh, I was still working on a, a precision gun that I was building, and uh, uh, someone else 
kept shooting my target. Before I ever got to put a bullet in, I'd notice with the spotting scope that there'd be one or two holes. And uh, that happened not only one time, but about three times. So I went to Floyd and told him I'm paying two bits for targets and putting them up and somebody shooting a hole in them before. So we got to looking and it was, and it was this fall that turned out to be Oswald. Well, what did you say to Oswald? Well, I uh, just kidded him like I would anyone else. I, uh, you don't just make a man mad to stand there with a high-powered rifle. You kind of got to approach him easy. And as well, if I was knowing the kind of a guy he was, I probably wouldn't have said anything. But I made a remark he's not getting any prize or not going to win a turkey by rapid fire and shooting someone else's target. What did he say to you? And uh, he he never said anything to me. In other words, he didn't say he was sorry. He just went in doing what he was doing. So, now, you say that he was shooting rapid fire. How rapid fire was he shooting? Well, for instance, he was shooting six, six times, say, in seven or eight or nine seconds. This could be fired quite rapidly. It's very, it's very possible to fire the gun at uh, a fairly rapid pace. Uh, it is clip fed, and uh, as quick as you can work that bolt, uh, well, it's it's very, very easy to fire rapid with it. It takes a little practice, though. You have to be uh, a good as a snapshot to uh, uh, bolt your rifle and then aim it. Although Oswald had considerable rifle training in the Marine Corps, he was rated a good but not excellent shot. Mr. Price and Mr. Splack say that they saw him practicing fast firing shortly before the assassination. The question for the Warren report, could he have fired three shots in about five seconds? Dan Rather continues. As the police and investigators for the Warren Commission reconstructed the Dallas story, Oswald fired his rifle from the sixth floor of the school book depository building. Yet, a few minutes later, possibly less than two minutes later, he was stopped by an armed policeman and identified by his own boss on the second floor and the other side of the building. The policeman's name was Marion Baker. I heard those shots come off and uh they seemed like they was high, and uh, they were directly ahead of me. And uh, as I, I tried to figure out which, where they came from, and the building that I had in mind was directly ahead of me, and that was the Texas Book Depository Building. As I entered the building there, I asked uh, some of the people that were standing around there where, where the stairs or elevator was. And uh, there was a man who spoke up and said uh, he was a building manager and he'd show me. I realized that he didn't know the layout of the building, so I ran in with him. It was just a matter of seconds after the third shot. And we ran across the shipping room floor, stopped at the elevators. And uh, we couldn't get that service elevator working. And uh, he said, well, we used the stairs, and he turned around and immediately went up the stairs. We ran on up the first flight to the second floor, and the officer looked in the snack bar adjacent to our office. And I, I, I kind of looked off to the right over there through a doorway and saw an image of a man walking away through that doorway. Uh, and when I got to the doorway, he was on down there a little bit, and I hollered at him asked him to come back. The officer with me had a gun in his hand, and uh, he threw the gun uh, toward the uh, middle of Oswald, and he looked probably a little startled, like anybody else would, if you just put a gun in his stomach all at once, which I thought was natural. But uh, I turned around and asked him if the man worked for him and if he knew him. And he said, yes, he works for me, and I, I know him. And uh, at that time, uh, the man never did say anything. I never did say anything further to him. Uh, I turned around and went on up the stairs to the third floor. Officer Baker 
As you uh, think back now to November 22nd, would you uh, hazard a guess as to uh, the time you heard these shots and the time it took you to get into the building and go up the stairs and the time when you first saw Lee Harvey Oswald? I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, from the time that I heard those shots and time I ran into that building, entered the lobby, and uh, made it up to the second floor, it was approximately a minute and a half to two minutes. And uh, that would be pretty close to it. In your testimony before the Warren Commission, uh, was this reenacted, uh, this timing? Yes, sir, it was. Would you tell me how you did it? Well, we went back to the same day that we figured what, what I did that particular day, and we tried to get to the spot where I thought I first heard the shots. And from there, we took it and we did everything, reenacted re the whole situation there, the ent entrance into the building and uh, the talk we had between the building manager and myself and then we went on back through the building and we tried to get the service elevator down and uh, we then went on up the stairs and that uh, I believe somewhere around a minute and a half was uh, our timing on it. As you recall it, does that seem like a reasonable uh, length of time for him to have been able to do those things? Uh, he could have done it if he'd have been off the fast or if he'd have uh, pre-planned it that way. But the, the uh, ceilings are low on uh, each floor and the, sh and the stairways do not have too many steps on them. In possibly less than two minutes, could Oswald have left the window, hidden the rifle, crossed the room, and gone down four flights of stairs? Could anyone do that? The Warren Commission considered uh, this one of the more important questions it had to answer. Investigators came to the school book building with stopwatches and critical eyes. Patrolman Baker, as he has said, reenacted his movements for them. Uh, and those movements uh, were timed again and again. Zero seconds. The shooting begins. The stopwatch starts. The Secret Service agent gets up and starts across the room. He moves quickly along the rows of school books. He has to go all the way to the opposite corner of the building. When he gets to the opposite corner of the building, he hides the rifle where Dallas police say they found it. Then downstairs, down four flights to the snack room. Remember, this is where the assassin had been at this window. He would have had to rise to go across this, the sixth floor, to hide the rifle in those boxes in the far corner, and then to go downstairs. Down four flights of stairs to where the lunchroom was. A minute, a minute thirty, two minutes, all the difference between innocence and guilt, between a case closed and an unknown assassin still at large. Not only police and government agents traced that route, Chief Justice Warren and some other commission members did it for themselves. Their printed report will reveal their conclusions on this all-important point. The final Warren Commission report has been printed. Newsmen have had their copies all weekend, and a half hour from now, the findings will be released to the public. We will report them to you at that time. Meanwhile, CBS News will continue with the stories of uh, key witnesses who testified before the Warren Commission including the cab driver who took Oswald home, the woman who saw Officer Tippett's murder, and the officer who captured Oswald. But first, station identification. In the last hour, CBS News has brought you the story of the Kennedy assassination as told by witnesses who appeared before the Warren Commission. The official stories are detailed in the printed commission report, which will be released in a half hour from now. The stories these witnesses have told CBS News are, in essence, the same as those they told the Commission. Through witnesses interviewed by Eddie Barker, we have followed President Kennedy from the corner of Elm and Houston Streets in Dallas to the announcement of his death at Parkland Hospital. 
Now we are about to follow another man from that same Dallas corner to that same hospital and his death. His name, Lee Harvey Oswald. Dan Rather reports. This is the way police reconstruct Oswald's movements after he was found in the lunchroom of the book depository building, after building manager Truly and policeman Bar uh, Baker had left him and ran up the stairs. Oswald walked past the company's main office on the second floor, the same floor on which he had just been questioned. He walked across to a larger stairway leading down and took those stairs outside to Elm Street. Now began the chase. The people involved were Cecil McWaters. He was a bus driver and at this moment was going west on Elm. William Whaley, a taxi driver. He was waiting for a pickup at the Greyhound station. A waitress, Miss Helen Markham. When she entered Oswald's life, she was on her way to work. And Ted Calloway, who was a used car dealer. The time was about 12.32 or slightly later. The Warren Commission will establish the exact time. Police had not yet sealed off the book depository building. There had not yet been time, considering the confusion and lack of knowledge about where the shots came from. Oswald was able to walk out by simply walking out. He started up Elm Street along this route. At Peel Street, he got on a bus. Can you give us any information as to what happened for these people out here? The president involved. I do not know the seriousness of it. The officers are now surrounding and searching the building. Book depository store on the corner of Elm and Peel, 1240. Where did this happen? At Peel and Main, Simmons, and the Triple Underpass. The traffic had come to a standstill, which is almost uh, even with Griffin Street here. Well, that's when uh, someone came up and knocked on the door of the bus, although this is no bus stop here. Knocked on the door of the bus, and I opened the door, and, and a man got on the bus and uh, paid his fare. And I wouldn't be positive, but I believe that he sat down on, uh, on the second seat on the right-hand side of the bus there. Eddie, did we reach this point here, traffic could come to a standstill. In other words, uh, uh, we were sitting here and uh, traffic was stopped and there was uh, a lady that was sitting behind me here, which was going to Union Station catch a train, a uh, one o'clock train. And she asked me if I would uh, give her a transfer and she decided she'd just walk on down to the station, which is seven or eight blocks from here. And uh, I gave her a transfer and she got off and at the same time, the gentleman that I picked up back up at uh, Murphy Street back here, in other words, uh, he got up and came up and got him a transfer and got off at the same time, in which that was the only two transfers that I, I put out uh, coming through town. And which uh, later they uh, identified, the police identified the transfer as the one that, uh, that they got on Oswald when he was arrested. Did they realize they had the suspect? No, they do not have the suspect. Are you having them contain that block or two block area? Yes, we're trying to seal off that building until it can be searched. By this time, most of Dallas, most of the United States, knew of the tragedy that had struck the motorcade and had begun to fear how great a tragedy it was. Oswald entered a cab. Well, he just looked like an ordinary working man. He was small, had on gray work clothes, brown shirt with a silver stripe, and a work jacket. He said he got in, said he wanted to go to 500 block North Beckley. So I come on the way we're going now and turned right on this signal light onto Jackson Street. I come on here to Austin Street turn left on this light to off to a wood. What did you talk to him about as you came around here? Well, I didn't talk very much. I didn't know the president was shot at that time, and the police cars and sirens were running all around this end of town, making a lot of noise, so all I said to him was, I wonder what the hell all the commotion is in this end of town. He didn't answer me, so I didn't say any more to him. I figured he was one of these people that didn't want to talk. He had something else on his mind. What time did you log the uh, fact that uh, this man got in your cab? I believe it was somewhere between uh, 12.15 and 12.45. I never log exactly on the minute. It's always approximate time. 
Now, you uh, say that uh, when he got in back there at the bus station and you started to cross here, about how long did it take you to make this run? Well, approximately some, approximately somewhere between six and a half and eight minutes. Mr. Whaley, when you went up to the Warren Commission, what were they more interested in than uh, anything else? Any particular area of your testimony? Well, yes, sir, in the time element, and what I put out on my sheet. They want to know why I approximated my time, and I explained to them that I put the trip down as every 15 minutes. That's four an hour, which is usually the run of it. You can't put them down exactly to the minute, because you'd have to stop on in traffic or be writing while you're moving, and that's dangerous. So I just approximate mine. It runs on the 15 minutes. Now, he lived uh, right here in this block. Right here, it? in the same block, right here, 1018. Which from the house right there? That house right there. But he didn't say anything about getting out. No, sir, and he wasn't looking at it as we passed. And about along right in here, he asked me, he said, he didn't ask me, he just said, this will do fine right here. But the cars were parked like this, and I waited until I passed the last car and pulled over to the curb, which was the intersection of Neely and North, and North Beckley. And uh, did you tell him how much the fare was? Or what? No, sir, I didn't. He just looked at the meter and it's 95 cents. He handed me a dollar, opened the door and got out, walked around in front of the cab and crossed the street, and that's the last I saw him. I went on about my business. Oswald had gone about four blocks past his boarding house. Now he began walking back. Dallas police already were broadcasting a description of their suspect. Attention all squad. Attention all squad. The suspect in the shooting at Elm and Houston is reported to be an unknown white male, approximately 30, slender build. I find him to be armed with what is thought to be a 30 caliber rifle. No further description at this time or information. 1245 KKB 360. Uh, watching as the world turns, it comes on from 12.30 to 1. And they, uh, they'd been on a few minutes, and they says a, a special bulletin. Here is a bulletin from CBS News. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. Well, I was listening, I uh, had the television on listening, trying to find out what happened to President Kennedy when he came in. It must have been after one o'clock because he come in and, you know how television things are blink on that way. Mm -hmm. I was trying to clear it up and he come in and he wasn't running, he was just in a fast walk. Well, now when he came in that day and you were uh, trying to fix the television set, mm -hmm. Did you uh, say anything to him about the president being shot or not? No, sir. I just said, oh, you sure are in a hurry. And he didn't answer me and didn't say nothing. When he went out, he went out walking fast the same way. And I was still listening there and bound broadcasting about President Kennedy. Oswald left the boarding house and started walking southeast. Where exactly he was going, nobody knows. and Patton, Mrs. Markham saw Oswald approach. Well, this man was walking along the sidewalk on 10th Street. This police car was uh, driving very slow down 10th Street. What happened? Well, the man kept walking, just like I say, with his hands down in his head. He, I didn't pay him no mind, I didn't care. And this police car kept coming on and coming on, and finally, he stopped, and the man stopped. And uh, whether the man, the policeman say, come over to the car, talk to him, I don't know, but he went. Was he on the driver's side or on the other side? On the other side. 
And did he stick his head in the window? Yes, sir. He folded his hands like this. He put them in through the window, up on the window, and he leaned over like this. What do you remember about this man? Was he a big man or a small man? No, he wasn't a very big man. He was short, kind of short, as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. Well, now, was he still standing there when Officer Tippett got out of the police car? Well, he got, you know, taken out, got out of the window, put his hands back down to his side, and stepped back that two steps. The policeman calmly opened the door. He calmly crawled out. And I, for me, I didn't pay no attention because I was, you know, tall, friendly. Uh, and he, the policeman walked to the, got to the, even the front wheel on the driver's side, and this man shot him in the wink of the eye. Just bang, bang, bang. And what did this man who had shot the officer, what did he do as soon as he had shot him? Did he move back or did he run or what? No, he, he didn't uh, break out and run fast. He walked fast down the sidewalk, back towards me, and then he seen me. And then he done like this. And of course I did too. And then I slapped my finger, hands up on my face. But I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. But what does it do? Did he say anything at all to you? He did not. I, just like I tell you, I closed my eyes and my hands right there. And then I stayed there a few minutes. And I was going to look and see if he's gone or coming after me or what. And I opened my fingers. And I looked and he was trotting off down across this lot up here. Then uh, he wasn't even out of sight. He saw me go to the policeman. Now, he could have killed me, too. I knew I had to get help for this man. And I knew this police car, all police cars got radios in them. And I just, I'll do what I can to get help for this man. And I tried. Around the corner, Ted Calloway was tending to business at his used car lot. Well, Eddie, I was uh, just quite upset and excited, I guess, over the shooting of the president. And I was just standing on the front porch of our used car lot office. And uh, I heard some shooting. What sounded to me like five shots coming from the back of our office in the direction of 10th Street over here. And uh, as soon as I heard the shooting, well, I come running off the porch out here on the Patton Street, out here on the sidewalk. And I looked up the street toward, that's 10th Street right there. And uh, I could see this uh, man running across the uh, sidewalk in the back of the taxi cab over to the other side of Patton Street right here. Where was he holding this gun when you saw him? I didn't notice the gun until he was on the other side of the street and running in this direction. Well, now, when he came down here, and you say he stopped where? About uh, over there in front of that house? Yes, sir, about 40, 45 feet away. Uh, I could see clearly he had this pistol in what we used to, in the Marine Corps, call the raised pistol position. And uh, he, was, he wasn't on a, a dead run, but a good, fast trot. And uh, I noticed that he was very pale. He was just deathly white, and uh, I hollered at him. I said, man, what in the hell is going on? And he almost stopped and said something to me, which I could not understand, and uh, faced in my direction, still with a pistol in this position, and then continued on down Jefferson in a good, fast trot. I mean, down, not down Jefferson, down Pat. What did you do, Mr. Calloway, after this man ran around the corner? Where did you go? I ran down the direction of the shooting, down toward Patton and 10th Street. And when I rounded the corner, I could see a squad car there. And by this time, there's two or three or four women had uh, gathered around. And I saw Officer Tippett laying in the street. Uh, I could tell by looking at him that he was dead. Uh, he was laying on his pistol. He had drawn his pistol. His sh uh, strap on his holster was uh, unsnapped. and. Uh, I imagine that he had drawn his pistol while he was falling because it was, he was laying on, under his left side. So I, I uh, took the pistol from under him and laid on top of the hood of the squad car 
And then I ran to the squad car and called in on the radio and told them that an officer had been shot. And uh, they said that someone else had already reported it, so for me to stay off the air. A witness to the murder, a witness to the murderer's flight. This is what Mrs. Markham and Mr. Calloway say they are. Does the Warren Commission believe them? And what have the other questions raised? When Oswald left the boarding house, where was he heading? Why did policeman Tippett stop him? Or was it Oswald who stopped Tippett? Was it really Oswald who shot Tippett? If so, why? After the Tippett shooting, Lee Harvey Oswald remained free, but he remained hunted. What happened to him next, the Warren Commission and CBS News learned from the two people most instrumental in hunting Oswald down. One of them was a clerk at a shoe store, his name Johnny Brewer. The other was a policeman, Nick McDonald. Oswald had taken off down a side street and across a back alley, pausing at his claim to reload his revolver. He knew the hunters were closing in. Police cars seemingly were everywhere. Johnny, when was the first time you saw Lee Harvey Oswald? Uh, saw him at Friday afternoon, November 22nd. He walked into the lobby of my store. Mm -hmm. How far in did he walk out there, John? Where, uh, just a few feet. He was standing right about where those tennis shoes are right there, just uh, about five feet from the door there. What made you suspicious of this man who walked into the lobby? Well, right after the uh, president had been shot, they broadcast a description on the radio of this man of 5'8", 5'9", 150 pounds. And this Oswald matched the description. And well, just a few minutes before he walked into the lobby, on the radio they had a bulletin that an officer had been shot here in Oak Cliff. And he walked in, he matched the description. Looked scared, just the way he stood there. You were standing right here behind standing the counter? Standing right here behind the counter listening to the radio. And uh, where did he walk to? Uh, how far well, he, into the lobby did he come? He walked right into the right-hand side of the lobby there, just a few feet from the door, and stood there looking in at the shoes there. Were there a lot of police cars in yeah, the area? Yeah, there was uh, a lot of police cars. Uh, there were some cars coming up Jefferson Street. They made that U-turn there and went back down Jefferson. And when they did, Oswald turned and walked up to the theater. When he went out the lobby and toward the theater. I walked out to the sidewalk and watched him go in. Then uh, I f walked up to the theater and asked Miss Postal there, the cashier, if she had sold a ticket to this man wearing the brown sports shirt, you know, his description. Uh, she called the police and uh, Butch stayed there at the front exit and I went back down by the stage, the back exit, and waited there until the police came. What happened when the police came? Well, uh, just before the police got there, they turned the house lights on the theater. And uh, I looked out the curtain and saw Oswald. And he stood up and walked to the aisle there and then turned around and sat back down. It's almost where he had been sitting. And then I heard this noise outside and uh, opened the door. And the police grabbed me and uh, asked me what I was doing there. And I told them. And they asked me if the man was still in theater. I said, yes. They asked me to uh, point him out. So uh, a couple, three other uh, policemen and myself walked out and uh, uh, pointed to him. And Officer McDonald, I, he was the first one to him. He uh, approached him, and Oswald stood up. Well, I entered the theater from the curtains on the left side of the screen. and. Uh, the George uh, uh, Johnny Brewer from the shoe store and a couple of other officers on the stage and he had pointed into the direction of the rear of the theater and said that was a man that uh, we were looking for sitting at the rear of the theater alone. And I spotted the, the man that he was talking about. Did you have your gun drawn? No, I didn't. And uh, as I walked up to the aisle, uh, Oswald was sitting in the second seat, the third row 
from the rear, the second seat from the right center aisle. This seat right over here? This seat right here. What happened then? Well, uh, let me let you use my pistol. Okay. Uh, and go through it a little bit, make sure it's empty so that okay. we don't have an accident. Mm -hmm. And he had it tucked in his belt on the right side. Like this? Yes. Of course, he had that shirt over it, but that will suffice. He was now. wearing a brown sports shirt, is that right? Yes, and he was sitting in that seat there with his hands in his lap. And as I, I walk, as I walked up to the aisle, I turned in the aisle, I said, get on your feet. And he stood up immediately. He brought this right hand up to his chest. Did he say anything when you As he was bringing that? his hands up, he brought the other one up to eye level. He said, well, it's all over now. At that time, I was reaching this way, and his hand got in front of mine, owned a pistol. And my hand grabbed the pistol in this manner, and he hit me with that uh, left hand to the nose, and when he did, I came back and hit him like this. He slapped the pistol. I turned the pistol around, and I got my hand on the butt. Came over like this. I was holding him with this hand. I handed this pistol to an officer that was out in the aisle. Officer McDonald, I've always heard that the gun that Lee Harvey Oswald had in his hand misfired. Is that correct? Well, it didn't actually misfire. Uh, if you'll cock it, I'll show you the position my hand was in whenever it snapped on me. The fleshy part of my hand between the thumb and forefinger was between the hammer and the firing pin hit the skin and then struck the primer, which slowed the action down. It sort of pinched that fleshy part of my hand in there. So actually, your it skin got between the uh, hammer and the primer? Yes, and it didn't uh, get the full force of the firing pin. Consequently, the, the shell didn't go off. And I believe that's what saved my life. Had you ever seen him prior to this day here in the state? Never in my lifetime. Here, the flight of Lee Harvey Oswald was ending an hour and a half after it began. involved in the shooting at the Texas Theater. Have there been any developments that you can tell me on the suspect that shot the officer? Was there any connection with the uh, shooting of the president? The uh, police came out to the house in the afternoon of the 22nd and asked if they could search. And I sa uh, said that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was in their custody for shooting an officer. And I said that most of their things were in the garage and went out with them to show the things. They asked if he had any guns. And uh, I said, I thought not. Translated the question to Marina, who said that she had seen uh, uh, the butt end of a rifle in a blanket roll that she indicated on the floor, perhaps two weeks back, and she had known that he'd had a gun, thought it was there. But uh, when they picked up the blanket roll, it was empty. When you went down to the police station and you were asked to identify this man in a lineup, how did you identify him? I wanted to be sure, so uh, I looked him over, I looked over. But that man, I know it was that man because I couldn't keep my eyes off of him. And uh, I kept looking at him, and uh, I had him turn to the side, then back, and then I knew that was him because the way he looked. Yes, sir, I saw him that night in the police lineup. I, they asked me to come down to police headquarters, and I identified him in the lineup as the man that I had seen running with a pistol in his hand. Did you have any trouble identifying him in the lineup? None whatsoever. Did he look as pale that night as he had uh, that afternoon? No, sir. No, sir. No, he didn't. But he was the type of an individual that once you see him, you never forget him. Why do you say that? There was just something outstanding about him, I guess, under the circumstances. Uh, I paid especially close attention to him, especially him with that gun in his hand, you know. But uh, I had no trouble at all in uh, picking him out of the lineup. I positively know nothing about the situation here. I would like to have re uh, legal representation. Well, I was uh, questioned by a judge. However, I uh, protested at that time that I was not allowed legal representation uh, during that, uh, that uh, very short and sweet hearing. 
uh, I really don't know what the, what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of uh, of uh, murdering a police. I know nothing more than that, and I do request uh, someone to come forward to give me uh, a legal assistance. Did you kill the president? No, I have not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. You have been. Somebody said what? Sir? You have been. Somebody said what? Okay, man. Okay. So, what did you do in right there? The turmoil in the lineup room had long before been taken over in the police station corridors. Everyone was there wanting to see Oswald, wanting to be shown the rifle. A police officer brought the rifle out. Foreign made, the press was told. Reporters were asking questions, newspaper photographers were hustling for better angles, television cameramen were feeding pictures, and one interested bystander was just looking on that Friday night. His name, Jack Ruby. Chicago-born Ruby was a Dallas nightclub owner. He had been a beer joint, uh, he had a beer joint downtown where girls did uh, striptease dances on stage. He didn't belong in the police station. Especially at a time like this. What then was he doing there? Did he know Oswald? Two more questions for the Warren Report to answer. These scenes we have witnessed, the scenes of Oswald being interrogated, exhibited, harried by policemen, cameramen, and reporters, these led the Warren Commission to still another question. How was Oswald treated in jail? Was he given all his civil rights? In Dallas, Eddie Barker asked that of the man most responsible, Police Chief Jesse Curry. Was Lee Harvey Oswald granted all of his civil rights during his confinement uh, in the city jail? Yes, sir. I believe that he was. Uh, we uh, did have some calls uh, from outsiders uh, as to whether or not he was being accorded his civil rights. And uh, we contacted the, uh, the head of the Dallas Bar Association at that time was Lewis Nichols. And he, well, I believe that he was one of them that called and said they had had some inquiries. And so we invited him to come down and talk to uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. He didn't appear to be scared. He didn't appear to be fearful. He seemed to know, at least as far as I could tell, that uh, at some point, if he wanted a lawyer, he'd get one. And if you can observe a man in jail as to whether he's scared or not, he didn't appear to be scared to me. Uh, maybe I was more scared than he was being there, but uh, in any event, he was quite calm, he discussed his problems, and when I uh, concluded my interview with him and satisfied myself that no one was mistreating him and that he, could, he hadn't asked for a lawyer and he could get one if he wanted it, why, as I was leaving, why, he uh, reclined back on uh, his bunk and lay back down there with his hands behind his head looking up. And that was the last I saw him. Unfortunately, Oswald's need for a lawyer soon ended. Instead of law, there was one man's impulse, or one man's plot, or the climax of a conspiracy. More questions for the Warren Commission to answer in just a few moments. The next day, Sunday, Oswald, as required by Texas law, was being transferred from the city jail to the county jail. As all the world knows, and as much of America witnessed, the man who had shown up Friday evening showed up again. floor of the Dallas City Hall, and that's a scuffle on the basement floor. It seems to concern the part of it. He has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. It is now 15 seconds after 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Sunday, September the 27th. As of this moment, the report of the President's Commission is public record. For the next half hour, we will search it for answers. First must come the answers to the two great overriding questions. Who killed John F. Kennedy? The commission answers unequivocally, Lee Harvey Oswald. Was Oswald acting alone 
or was he a member of a conspiracy? The commission answers, he acted alone. But such answers of themselves carry no conviction. They must be buttressed by incontrovertible evidence. And in supplying that evidence, the commission was obliged to answer a host of lesser questions, those posed earlier in this program, as well as others raised by the commission itself in the course of its investigation. Could it be shown beyond a reasonable doubt, for example, that the weapons used in the murders of President Kennedy and Officer Tippett were the rifle and gun owned by Oswald. The report cites evidence that Oswald owned the murder rifle. The mail order purchase slip for that rifle was in his handwriting. Marina Oswald testified he owned the rifle. She photographed him holding it with his camera. Oswald's palm print was found on a surface of the gun. Equally detailed evidence linked Oswald with the revolver that killed Officer Tippett. Why did Oswald break his routine and go home to Irving on a Thursday night? Well, again, the commission's answer is unequivocal. He went home expressly to get the rifle he had secreted in the garage. He had at least an hour to do it, and Mrs. Payne says that late Thursday night she found the light burning in the garage. And, says the commission, it was that rifle, disassembled, which he carried in a paper parcel into the Texas School Depository building Friday morning, the parcel he called Curtain Rock. The shots, all the shots, came from the Texas School Depository, says the report. It cites evidence uh, like that of Hank Norman earlier in this program. Well, I was uh, looking out the window, and uh, the first shot was fired. Well, it, you know, I didn't think much of it, because it kind of, you know, shook the building a little bit. Really. It was just that powerful. Then after the second shot was fired, well, I saw the people, they were all falling on the ground, and. And I told one of the fellows, I said, that shot came from this building. And uh, then by the time I got through in the third shot, and one of the guys told me, said, I believe you're right, man. And I said, I know it did. And then I could, you know, also hear the hulls, empty hulls hitting the cartridges hitting the floor. And I could hear the rejection of the rifle, whatever it was. I don't, and um, the first thing we thought is, we better get out from here because I know I didn't want to be involved in anything like that because I didn't have anything like that on my mind. I mean, you know, I was. According to the commission report, the experiment with the shells and rifle was repeated for members of the commission. All seven of the commissioners clearly heard the shells drop to the floor. Painstaking second by second reconstruction of the assassination and analysis of the wounds shows unmistakably, the commission says, that all the bullets came from that window. Quote, the cumulative evidence of eyewitness, firearms, and ballistic experts and medical authorities demonstrated that the shots were fired from above and behind President Kennedy and Governor Connolly, more particularly from the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository Building, end quote. And the commission cites a wealth of evidence, including an eyewitness we heard earlier, putting Lee Harvey Oswald in that window. I looked directly across and up, possibility at a 45 degree angle, and this man same man I had saw prior to the president's arrival was in the window and taking aim for his last shot. After he fired the last or the third shot, of, he didn't seem to be in a great rush, hurry. He. Uh, seemed to pause for a moment to see if for sure he accomplished his purpose. And he brought the gun back to rest in upright position as though uh, he was satisfied. The commission believes that Oswald probably fired three shots, but that only two struck home. Three empty shells were found by the window, all fired according to ballistic evidence from the rifle linked to Oswald. One bullet and two large bullet fragments were found, and these two were definitely fired by that rifle. The commission isn't sure which of the three missed, but it believes that the first one to take effect struck President Kennedy in the back of the neck, passed through the throat, then went completely through Governor Connolly's upper body and wrist. It was the next hit, the commission finds, which caught the president at the back of the skull and caused the massive fatal brain damage. The commission notes uh, Governor Connolly's insistence that he was hit by a separate bullet. I hate to put myself in a position of arguing with ballistics experts and so forth, but I know uh, I know a little something about 
uh, firearms and a little something about velocity of bullets and, and the speed of sound as compared to it. And I know when I hear a shot and uh, I have time to uh, turn and react and not only turn one direction, but uh, attempt to turn in another direction uh, before I feel the impact of anything, I know that bullet wasn't in transit that long. Now, that's all there is to it. Nobody ever convinced me otherwise. But the commission finds the evidence against the governor's theory strong. Exhaustive tests and expert testimony have convinced the commission that Oswald had time enough to get off three shots with, with his bolt-action rifle and was marksman enough to hit the president twice at that range using a telescopic sight. But the commission discards the testimony of Malcolm Price and Garland Slack, who said they saw Oswald actually practicing on a rifle range outside town. Oswald was in Mexico at that time, says the commission, just a case of mistaken identity. That would tend to clear up another puzzling question. Mr. Price had said Oswald reached the range by car, but at this time, according to Ruth Payne's testimony, he had not yet learned to drive. Now, Price and Slack are among many witnesses whose testimony was investigated and then rejected by the commission. Now the report carefully reconstructs Oswald's movements, arriving at much the same picture that we saw before in the CBS News program. Reenactments prove, the report says, that Oswald did have time, just enough time, to fire the shots, secret the rifle, and get down to the second floor cafeteria. And uh, as we approached the second floor, he uh, continued on around towards the third floor. And I, ca I kind of looked off to the right over there through a doorway and saw an image of a man walking away through that doorway. Uh, and when I got to the doorway, he was on down there a little bit, and I hollered at him and asked him to come back. And uh, so as he approached me, uh, this building manager, who is Mr. Truly, later I found it out his name, and uh, I turned around and asked him if the man worked for him, and if he knew him. And he said, yes, said he works for me, and I, I know him. And uh, at that time, uh, the man never did say anything. I never did say anything further to him. Uh, I turned around and went on up the stairs to the third floor. And this man that you saw later turned out to be Lee Harvey Oswald. Yes, sir, he did. An official reenactment showed that Oswald could have gotten from the window to the lunchroom in one minute, 14 seconds. And the report goes on, quote, the minimum time required by Patrolman Baker to park his motorcycle and reach the lunchroom was within three seconds of the time needed to walk from the southeast corner of the sixth floor uh, down to the stairway to the lunchroom. The time actually required for Baker and Truly to reach the second floor on November 22nd was probably longer than in the test run. Now, the building itself, the commission reports, was not sealed off until at least seven minutes after the assassination. Oswald had time to get out. The report finds no time discrepancy. Also, the commission says Oswald had time enough to get to his boarding house by bus, taxi, and foot. Where was he going when he left the boarding house? Well, the commission doesn't know. But it does say, quote, his general description was similar to the one broadcast over the police radio, and that policeman Tippett did stop Oswald, not the other way around. Did Oswald shoot Tippett? Definitely, says the commission. Nine eyewitnesses placed Oswald at the scene of the crime. Two actually saw him commit the murder. One was Mrs. Mark. This man came over to the police car, folded his hands like this, leaned over in the police car, stayed there just a very few minutes. He they got back, put his hands down, taking about two steps back. And this, and this policeman calmly opened the car door. He calmly crawled out of this car and started around in front of the car. Whether he had a gun, I don't remember that in his hand. And just as he got even with the front wheel, this man shot him across the hood of the car. This footnote, the commission is satisfied that it was Lee Harvey Oswald who tried to kill General Edwin Walker on the night of April 10th, 1963. We come now to the second overriding question the Warren Commission must answer. Was there a conspiracy against the life of John F. Kennedy? On page 21, it is stated, 
and we're quoting here from the commission report. The commission has found no evidence that either Lee Harvey Oswald or Jack Ruby was part of any conspiracy, domestic or foreign, to assassinate President Kennedy. The commission also notes in its phrase, and we're quoting here, because of the difficulty of proving negatives to a certainty, perhaps we should repeat that phrase, because of the difficulty of proving negatives to a certainty, the possibility of others being possibly involved with either Oswald or Ruby cannot be established categorically, unquote from the Warren Commission report. But, says the report, if there is any such evidence it has been beyond the reach of all investigative agencies and sources of the United States and has not come to the attention of the Commission. Now, what are those questions which might have indicated a plot? The Commission considers them all. The curious circumstance of Oswald having a job in a building uh, right over the parade route. The Commission found that he got that job after the President's Dallas trip was announced, but before the motorcade route could possibly have been chosen, in fact, before it was even decided where the president would be going in that motorcade. Now, the report examines Oswald's trip to Russia, his attempted trip to Cuba, his attempt to start a chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And the report concludes that these were manifestations of Oswald's own warped and dissatisfied personality. Quote, the commission has found no evidence to show that Oswald was employed, persuaded, or encouraged by any foreign government to assassinate President Kennedy. And despite Marguerite Oswald's testimony, the report adds, there was nothing to support the speculation that Oswald was an agent, employee, or informant of the FBI or the CIA or any other governmental agency. Where then did Oswald get the money to pay back the State Department? The Commission made a detailed study of Oswald's income and outgo. It says that he lived frugally, had nothing but coffee for breakfast, a sandwich for lunch, and that he could have saved that amount of money. Now, what about the passport he got in one single day? The Warren Report says this is routine time and that Oswald was handled routinely. Now, as for learning Russian in the Marine Corps, the Commission says he did this entirely on his own. Now we come to a part of the story that I remember vividly. The questions, why was Ruby at the jail on Friday night? Did Ruby know Oswald? The Warren Commission exhaustively probed reports that Ruby and Oswald had been seen together before the investigation. Says the study, in all but a few instances where the commission was able to trace the claim to its source, the person responsible for the report either denied making it or admitted that he had no basis for making the original allegations. Now those few instances, the report indicates, were probably simple cases of mistaken identification. The other question, what was Ruby doing at the jail Friday, leads to a far bigger one. Why did Ruby kill Oswald? That question is not specifically answered in this report. What answers there are here are those that emerge from the Commission's reconstruction of Ruby's weekend. So let's reconstruct that weekend. Thursday night, Ruby's activities are normal for him. He visits his two nightclubs. He dines with his financial angel. He bounces a noisy patron. Friday, Ruby is at the office of the Dallas Morning News, placing his weekend advertising when the assassination story breaks. Ruby appears, according to one witness, obviously shaken. There is a dazed expression in his eyes, according to this witness. He decides to close his clubs in mourning. The commission does not accept a report that Ruby was seen at Parkland Hospital shortly after President Kennedy was brought in. Now Ruby begins a tangled two-day series of local and long-distance calls to people, relatives, acquaintances, to discuss the assassination. A sister describes him as completely unnerved and crying. On Friday night, Ruby attends a memorial service at a synagogue. He later shows up at police headquarters and actually participates in the press conference questioning of Oswald. Later, according to the commission report, Ruby wanders around Dallas talking to acquaintances about the assassination. He is incensed by Friday's black-bordered newspaper ad attacking President Kennedy and by a billboard that says, impeach Earl Warren. Ruby says, according to a committee witness, and this is a direct quote, this is the work of the John Birch Society or the Communist Party or both. And he does some ineffectual detective work, trying to track down the source of the newspaper ad. Incidentally, the commission says that this ad was the work of some independent right-wingers who had big plans for infiltrating the existing far-right movement and taking them over for their own profit. On Saturday, Ruby watches a rabbi eulogizing the late president on television. Then Ruby visits the scene of the murder. And he boasts to a friend that he's been 
acting like a reporter. Saturday night, Ruby is depressed again. He criticizes two other nightclub owners for staying open after the assassination. And Ruby says, I've got to do something about this. Though it's unclear whether he means the competition or the killing. Saturday morning, Jack Ruby's testimony to the Warren Commission says, and I quote, I saw a letter to Carolyn, two columns, about a 16-inch area. Someone who had written a letter to Carolyn, the most heartbreaking letter. And continuing to quote Jack Ruby's testimony to the Warren Commission, I don't remember the contents. Alongside that letter on the same sheet of paper was a comment in the paper that I don't know how it was stated, that Mrs. Kennedy may have come back to the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. Suddenly the feeling, the emotional feeling came within me that someone owed this debt to our beloved president to save her the ordeal of coming back, unquote from Jack Ruby. A little later that morning, Ruby killed Lee Oswald. What happened to Lee Harvey Oswald in the Dallas police jail? Says the Warren Commission, all available evidence indicates that Oswald was not subjected to any physical hardship during the interrogation sessions or at any other time while he was in custody. The commission finds that Oswald's bruised eye and slight cut were indeed the result of that scuffle with Officer McDonald inside the theater. But the commission does indict the Dallas police for permitting and us of the press for creating the bedlam that existed in the Dallas jail during Oswald's last two days of life, that jammed corridor full of lights, cameras, and shouting reporters. And that leads to the next great question. Who is responsible for the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald? Jack Ruby, of course, did it. The commission points out that millions of people saw him do it on television. But how was he able to do it in the midst of a crowd of police in the very basement of police headquarters? Now, once again, the commission assigns the blame to the police department and to the press. And by press, the commission certainly includes radio and television. First, says the Warren Commission report, responsibility for Oswald's safety during the transfer was never clearly assigned. Result, confusion. Again, a quote. The failure of the police to remove Oswald secretly or to control the crowd in the basement at the time of the transfer were the major causes of the security breakdown which led to Oswald's death. Then the report goes on to add that the commission believes that the news media, as well as the police authorities who failed to impose conditions more in keeping with the orderly process of justice, must share responsibility for the failure of law enforcement which occurred in the connection with the death of Oswald. Police Chief Curry failed to restrain the newsmen, the commission indicates, and the newsmen failed to restrain themselves. Reporters, according to the commission report, displayed a regrettable lack of self-discipline, disobeying police orders, shouting questions at Oswald, and constantly pursuing public officials. The report concludes the promulgation of a code of professional conduct governing representatives of all news media would be welcome evidence that the press had profited by the less of Dallas, the lesson of Dallas. If you had to go through this again, what would you do differently? Well, that's a difficult question for me to try to answer. I can very definitely say this, that uh, I'm afraid that uh, uh, I would be criticized again, but uh, Probably it would be from the news media because I wouldn't let them inside the city hall. That same combination of journalistic insistence and official indulgence, according to the Warren report, spawned much of the confusion and many of the discrepancies that have plagued this story ever since, and we quote the commission report, in their efforts to keep the public abreast, the police reported hearsay items and unverified leads. Further investigation proved many of these to be incorrect. Some examples, a deputy constable who never handled the rifle and only saw it lying here in the book depository, called it a German Mauser. And the press and the district attorney were saying Mauser the rest of the day. There was no name on that gun, which was actually the Italian Carcano. On the sixth floor of the depository, the police found some chicken bones and said Oswald had been eating them. He hadn't. Bonnie Ray Williams had a bit earlier. The police said that in Oswald's room, they'd found a map with the motorcade route marked. That map actually was marked, according to the Warren Commission, with places where Oswald may have applied for jobs. Once the district attorney gave a news conference and told us Oswald had caught a taxicab driver and gone to Oak Cliff. A stenographer misunderstood and wrote in the transcript that Oswald had caught a taxicab driver, Daryl Click. I remember reporters scurrying around for the rest of the day trying to find that non-existent Mr. Click. 
The press may also be partly to blame, partly responsible for the persistent rumor that there was a second assassin shooting from the railroad overpass. Two reporters said they had seen a bullet hole through the front bridge windshield of the presidential automobile. The Warren Commission says that it wasn't a hole, but a little nick caused by a piece of bullet striking the inside of the windshield. The FBI found lead on the inside only. Now, what about the doctor at Parkton Hospital who reportedly said the president was wounded in the front? Actually, the doctor told the commission and a newspaper report agrees. that He said only that the bullet could have entered from the front. But because of the president's condition and their desperate haste, the doctors never turned him over, never saw the similar wound where the bullet actually entered from the back. Now, the report asserts that there were two witnesses who saw the rifle being fired from the book depository. No witnesses who saw any rifle anywhere else. The commission report goes on to add that on the overpass were 13 railroad men and two policemen, and that all of them say there were no shots from that overpass. The impression of the shots from the overpass, says the report, may have been the result of an echo. One final question of conspiracy. The FBI knew of Oswald's dubious background, knew he was in Dallas, but the Dallas police were not warned. Had the Dallas Police Department uh, ever heard of Lee Harvey Oswald prior to November? No, sir, we, didn't, we did not have any uh, information on this man in our criminal intelligence file, and that's normally where it would have been, in our subversive file, as we refer to it. The Dallas police were not warned, the commission found, because the Secret Service was not warned. The Secret Service was not warned because of insufficient liaison among the federal law enforcement agencies, one of the three great flaws which the Warren Commission believes contributed to the death of President Kennedy. In the Commission's words, quote, there was insufficient liaison and coordination of information between the Secret Service and other federal agencies necessarily concerned with presidential protection. Although the FBI, in the normal execution of its responsibility, had secured considerable information about Lee Harvey Oswald, it took an unduly restrictive view of its role in, in preventive intelligence work prior to the assassination. A more carefully coordinated treatment of the Oswald case, the report goes on, by the FBI, might well have resulted in bringing Oswald's activities to the attention of the Secret Service. Continuing the quote, the criteria and procedures of the Secret Service designed to identify and protect against uh, persons considered threats to the president were not adequate uh, prior to the assassination. Continuing the quote, the effect the Secret Service largely relied upon other federal or state agencies to supply the information necessary for it to fulfill its preventive responsibility, unquote. In some respects, the commission says, advanced preparations for the president's trip were deficient. It lists failure by the Secret Service to spell out responsibilities of local police and others. Inadequate Secret Service procedures for spotting an assassin in the building. And poor seating arrangements in the presidential car. But the commission adds, within these limitations, the agents most immediately responsible for the president's safety reacted promptly at the time the shots were fired. And the commission warned soberly, consistent with their high responsibility, Presidents can never be protected from every potential threat. So says the commission, Lee Harvey Oswald shot President Kennedy, but apparently not as part of a conspiracy. Then why? The answer the commission suggests is largely psychological. Quote, the commission could not make any definitive determination of Oswald's motives. It has endeavored to isolate factors which contributed to his character and which might have influenced his decision to assassinate President Kennedy. These factors were his deep-rooted resentment of all authority, which was expressed in a hostility toward every society in which he lived, his inability to enter into meaningful relationships with people, and a continuous pattern of rejecting his environment in favor of new surroundings, his urge to try to find a place in history, and his despair at times over failures in his various undertakings, his capacity for violence, as evidenced by his attempt to kill General Walker. His avowed commitment to Marxism and communism, as he understood the terms and developed his own interpretation of them. This was expressed by his antagonism toward the United States, by his defection to the Soviet Union, by his failure to be reconciled with life in the United States even after his disenchantment with the Soviet Union, and by his efforts, though frustrated, to go to Cuba. 
And the Warren Report concludes, each of these contributed to his capacity to risk all in cruel and irresponsible action. Two further impressions are inescapable from even a casual reading of the commission report. First, Oswald was a liar. During the few hours between his arrest and his death, he was repeatedly interrogated. The commission report reveals that he lied on important matters of substance. He lied about his rifle, his revolver, his movements, the documents found on his person. Second, no investigation could have been more painstaking than that carried out by this commission. Every resource of criminology was called into play, ballistics tests, analysis of the guns themselves, handwriting analysis, the blanket in which the rifle was wrapped, the photographs and the documents linking Oswald to the crime. And Earl Warren was not too dignified to race down the stairs at the depository building, watch a matching his time against Oswald's. In the end, we find confronting each other the liar, the misfit, the defector on the one hand, and seven distinguished Americans on the other. And yet, exactly here, we must be careful that we do not say too much. Oswald was never tried for any crime, and perhaps, therefore, there will forever be questions of substance and detail raised by amateur detectives, professional skeptics, and serious students as well. For the Warren Commission could not give Lee Harvey Oswald his day in court and the protection of our laws. Suspects are not tried by seven distinguished Americans. Their cases are heard under law by 12 ordinary citizens. If it had not been for Jack Ruby's revolver in the basement of the Dallas police station, 12 such citizens would have heard the evidence, would have heard Oswald if he had chosen to speak. That jury would have represented our judgments, our conscience, and in the end would have spoken for us. Now, we do not have that reliance. We must depend upon our own judgments and look into our own consciences. The Warren Commission cannot do that for us. We are the jury, all of us, in America and throughout the world. On Monday, November 25th, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was buried in a plain wooden coffin. As he was lowered into his grave, his secrets were buried with him. In Washington that day, there was another funeral. This has been a CBS News Extra. November 22nd, and The Warren Report. has been produced by CBS News, which has sole responsibility for its content and editing. This is the CBS Television Network.